Welcome to the junction. This is the XFL. This is the SEC Junction XFL Podcast. Are you ready for some football? This is the SEC Junction XFL podcast. We are delighted to have special guests today and to discuss the Roughneck and Renegade rivalry. This is not a solo program. On the program, we have Mr. Anthony Miller from XFL Board and Ms. Chrissy Freud from Tiger LSU Tiger Wire, USA Today, SMG, Tiger Wire, and Titan Wire. Good. How are y'all two? Good. How are you? Very Good. Well. Thanks for Thanks for having me. No problem. It's a pleasure. I'm, I really do appreciate y'all both uh, making time for, for being on the podcast today. It's uh, it's nice. So, uh, so that you know. So first off, what is y'all? What has y'all? What has been your experience for the XFL this these first few weeks? Have y'all been? Uh, has it met ex- expectations? Has it exceeded expectations? So just what's y'all general ex- experience with it? Um, I think it looks like it's been pretty successful thus far. Um, I've been to Houston's two home games so far. There's, I want to say they're they're on the road for two or three weeks straight, um, with obviously the game against the Renegades coming up in Dallas. But uh, the atmosphere has been good. The fans have been passionate, and it's been it's been a good deal so far. I haven't noticed a significant decline. And as I've said before, I did cover the Alliance of American football and the atmosphere was kind of so-so and there was that sharp decline after the first week or two. Yeah. So you can, you can see the difference. Huh? And you, Anthony. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I would say um, I was at the Dallas Renegades first home game in week one against St. Louis and the crowd there was really good. I mean, it, I guess for me being a, a Texas native, it was weird for me to see Globe White Park be a football stadium, but right. they did a fantastic job with it. And the atmosphere was fantastic. The crowd was rowdy. I think they had over 17,000 fans. So it felt like there was a lot of people in that stadium and it was really good crowd, despite the fact that they ended up losing. But I mean, besides, besides that, you know, just watching on TV wise, I think it's been a really good experience. I know watching that the the St. Louis games and all the home games with Seattle, it's been kind of surreal to see how many fans were have been there to support their team. So I think overall, it's just been a really fun experience. And it's been great to see that there hasn't been too much of a decline between week one and week three. So it, it's been enjoyable to watch for sure. You're right. Being in Texas, how does it feel to be on the streets? Do you feel like there's something happening? Like, is there? can you feel that there's a spring uh, football season going on? Or does it seem kind of like a niche, kind of like in the just just on the weekends or something? Um, well, I actually I commute between Texas and Baton Rouge. Um, I'm from Texas. I so I'm in town basically on game day and a couple days around game day. And I'd say that people seem excited, but I can't I can't necessarily give insight like throughout the week, like what I see on the street because I'm not there on a consistent basis. Right. Yeah, I I would just say from a Dallas perspective, I think it's starting to grow a little bit more, but there's still people that are just waiting to see if this thing is for real or not. I think uh, some people got burned with San Antonio last year with the Mm -hmm. Alliance. So I think there's a little bit of trust issues and trying to figure out if this thing's for real or not. I think Dallas winning the last two games is definitely going to help. And I think this game this weekend with Houston, it's going to be big. And I think it's going to bring in a lot of people. I know there's a a couple of radio stations that are starting to slowly talk about the Renegades and how well they're doing. Viewership wise, it's doing pretty well in you know the local area with Dallas Renegade games. I think they're getting a lot of people. So I, I think it's slowly growing and hopefully probably with 
you know, by the end of the year, it will get better just because I think a lot of people got tired of how the Dallas Cowboys have been struggling over the last few years. So I think they're looking for that football team to be successful in a city. So maybe the Renegades will be that team to fill the void. Um, I wanted to ask you about radio programs. Are there radio programs? Like we were, just before we were talking about people like Dallas and conversations in Dallas, have they started to have convert, uh, and even radio programs mentioning XFL, but have they had have they begun to have radio shows for certain teams? Not really, huh? <laughs> no. I, oh, sorry. I was gonna say just if in Dallas there hasn't been a lot of radio per se. Um, we have a radio station here called the Fan that's been kind of covering the Renegades, but besides that, there hasn't been a ton of radio covering uh, the Renegades right now. Okay. Chrissy? Yeah, as far as Houston goes, uh, like I said, I'm not here on a consistent basis. Whenever I'm in the press box, I don't see a tremendous amount of, amount of radio people, although there is a girl that I know named Holly that works for ESPN 97.5, and her and her station seem to be really about what's going on. So I'd say that they definitely keep up with it. Um, I know John McClain has made some radio appearances before, and he keeps up with it. But as far as like a significant radio presence in the manner in which the Texans or the Rockets might be presented, it's probably not there yet, if I had to take a guess. So, uh, let, you know, it's just as I'm thinking about Houston and Dallas again, I wanted to get a feel as a, uh, as a Louisiana native, like how much is the rivalry between the two cities going to play into this? Like, what what is the... What is the root of the rivalry? Is it just your general city versus city kind of thing? Or is there something more deeper in Texas between Dallas and Houston? Because I think from the outsider perspective, what I know is that Dallas is kind of the the, the, the new money kind of city, kind of like the Los, mm-hmm. Angeles, Los, Angeles, Los Angeles of Texas, where you have the new money and those kind of people. And Houston's a little more, uh, I don't know, like a little extension of Louisiana maybe, but like in a different and it's, with its own little taste of Texas. Can you um, I, I'd say, considering that I am from Houston, um, I would say that there's always kind of been a rivalry, like city to city between Houston and Dallas, and I think that that extends into sports. Uh, it's In Texas, it seems like you, if you're an NFL fan, you either like the Texans or you like the Cowboys, and there's no in-between, and the people who like the Cowboys hate each other. Uh, I'm sorry, the people who like the Texans and the people who like the Cowboys tend to hate each other. But as far as this goes, I would say that it's still so new that I wouldn't say that there's like a deep seated rivalry between these two teams. I would say that there is between the two cities, but not the two teams, because like I said, the XFL is new. It's not totally cemented. And there are those few kind of super fans that were super fans from the beginning. But um, I think I think a rivalry could develop, but I don't think that it's totally there now, just given that we are in at this point going into week four. And Dallas, Anthony, how do you feel? Is, is Dallas a little more, uh, little more stuck up? <laughs> or <laughs> how are they? I I would tend to agree with uh, Chrissy on the topic that maybe right now in the XFL, there's probably not going to be as big of a rivalry between Dallas and Houston, but I could definitely see it develop as the year goes on and maybe as the next you know year or two goes on as well. I, I would say the... The issue is, I was looking at the NFL perspective, when the Texans first came into town, I think Dallas was just kind of like, well, wait a minute, where are the team in Texas that's been ruling for you know the past couple of decades? Why are they coming in here thinking that they can come back you know, after being with the, the Oilers? So I think there was some resentment there, and especially after that uh, first game that Houston played where they beat Dallas the first year they were in existence as a franchise, I think there was a lot of en- envy between them. I know in baseball here in Dallas, especially nobody likes Houston. Nobody likes the Astros. I mean, it's a little different now. It seems like the country doesn't like him, but that <laughs> rivalry kind of started before then where no one was really an Astro fan. No one would ever cheer for them. So I think in, diff- in the other sports, there is that sense of just hatred towards Houston. I don't know if that's developed in the XFL yet, but that can definitely probably start this weekend depending on how the game goes, if that hatred will definitely grow within the XFL or not. Right. I mean, like, you know, we say I, I have you both on to discuss this upcoming weekend. And I think week four in general throughout the XFL is going to be pretty interesting and, and pretty intriguing. I think the play in the, in the league is getting better. And I think I think it's been a little unfortunate with the schedule. I think uh, in week two, for example, on that Saturday, I was really 
a little bit of a downer on the football side of things. But it was really just, uh, you know, we kind of expected uh, Tampa and Seattle to be a, a little bit of an ugly game based on their first uh, performances. And then uh, New York was it was a very was a disappointment against D.C. I personally thought D.C. New York was going to be a great game, and it was anything but. But uh, but with this with this weekend, we have a few good games outside of the rivalry. But this rivalry could be one of three games on the year because you have the two divisional games, the home and away uh, deal, and then you might have a semifinal game. And so it'll be exciting to see it build up maybe to the semifinal. Don't y'all, isn't that just, uh, maybe that's where it comes from. Maybe, maybe the rivalry will, 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 will really uh, evolve from the, the semifinal games. Yeah, like I said, I think that it's something that could take form, but it's, it's just not going to be there this early in the season quite yet. Yeah, and I think since both teams are looking to be uh, pretty good this year and might be the two teams that come out of the, the West, it, that rivalry may just develop on the fact that both teams are good and maybe they're just envious of how you know how good both are. So that might be the one that's most likely to develop more than any other of the rivalries. So I think it'll develop throughout the year. It just may be a little slow getting there. Okay. So, so you do feel, I mean, we did kind of say it already, but... So you do have a feeling that it is a bit slow getting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. uh, you but you know, in, in it is a little bit true to, to say because there is an example of even on the broadcast, I believe it was on Fox, he called the wrong team because Renegade Roughneck that has a nice little ring to it for for a rival game. But I think it was a Renegade score a touchdown and he said, or I can't remember actually who what team it was. But anyway, the guy on TV. One of them scored a touchdown, and he said the other team's name. So that was like that just shows how new this actually is. Yeah, it, I, I think it's a matter of broadcasters getting used to uh, all the new teams, all the new names, the new rules, the new terminology. And then with these teams being in such close proximity to each other in the same state, and then honestly with kind of similar names, I guess you could say to a certain extent, it's kind of it's something that's easy to mix up in your mouth, I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, how long did it take for broadcasters to get used to the idea of calling the San Diego Chargers the Los Angeles Chargers? Yes. I mean, they messed up on that pretty much every game that first year they were in Los Angeles. So that's it. That's just going to be for the broadcasters, you know, take time for them to get used to saying the right names. Well, Anthony, I, I'm, I'm, I must be just a little out of the loop because the only football team that I've seen play is the Wildcats. So I'm not too sure what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's for the uh, that that other league. I don't know what they're called. The NFL, I think. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. But um, so actually, while we're talking about broadcast and this, let me quickly ask you what what because a lot of people are presenting the XFL as made for TV. But you also talked about the experience. So what would you uh, what would you recommend the TV experience compared to other things you've seen with football or the or the in the stadium? in-game experience, the, the whole game experience. Uh, Chrissy? Mm. As far, can, can you clarify what you're asking? Are you asking about how they ask questions, like in the middle of the games? Like no, right after the play? I'm asking just for the general experience of football compared to other football uh, experiences, like NFL. Oh, football. okay. So how this compares to maybe like other football programs on right. broadcast. Because, you know, with uh, if, if I should elaborate a little more, uh, a lot of people present the XFL as made for TV with all the access. You know, they, they say, why uh-huh. go to the games? With this? And they don't really care. I'm not sure if that's the right terminology to say. Is they don't really care. But they're not so infatuated with the numbers of state of the attendees. They're more, they, they're, they're, their market deal is more about how many viewers they have on TV. So I just want to hear from you since you've both been to the game and mm-hmm. uh, seen it on TV. How is it like? What, what would you prefer? Like, do you see it more as a TV uh, league, or do you see it more, or do you actually say, you know what, the game, in-game experience is actually something special too? Well, I would say that the in-game experience is good. Um, it, at least in Houston, even through the first and second weeks, I'd say that people were very imbo- involved, very pumped up about what was going on. A, a lot of fans were already all decked out, which I was really surprised to see because when I was covering the Birmingham iron and the Memphis express and the Alliance, I mean, you might see one person with like a Jersey or one person with like a hat that had the team name on it. 
And I mean, these guys are already going all out. And as far as the TV aspect goes, I think they've done a very nice job with that. Um, partnering with people like ESPN and having all, like, like you mentioned, all the access, all the people that come onto the field and can ask questions right after a play. And we've seen that get interesting, especially with Matt McGloin's comments. Yeah, right. Anthony, same or you? How do you feel? Yeah, so it's. I think both experiences are really good. It's just kind of depends. I, I think fans should experience both because when you look at the TV aspect, it's so different from what you see with the NFL. With how much inside access do you have with locker rooms and the interviews with the players and just the up close shots that you have with you know, looking at special teams or any kind of those plays or just listening in on what the coaches and players are saying to each other. That's an experience you're never going to really get with the NFL. It might be something that the NFL may develop since now that uh, the XFL is you know developing that technology to do it. So we may see it in the NFL in the future, but for now, it's an experience you would never see watching the NFL. This is the only experience you would see with the XFL. So I think that's a cool aspect in terms of being in the um, game day experiences like in Dallas, it was a great atmosphere. A lot of people were super excited about it. You saw a ton of renegade gear. Like it was a great experience. And I, I think it's more, it feels more family friendly to go to an XFL uh, game just because, you know, prices are lower. Uh, there's a lot more activities for the kids to do. And plus uh, they had autograph booths set up with some of the players before the game. Do they so, really? Yeah, they had a couple. They had like three or four of the players go out and you know sign autographs for the kids and stuff like that. So that's something you would never. That was that's something you'll never see in the NFL. But that's something that you will get for the XFL because they're trying to be more about the fans than what I've experienced with at least the NFL. So that's a cool experience for um, you know families to come out and experience that. I, I truly think it's been pretty impressive how much the XFL has has done with. It. Fan access. Even I didn't. I actually did not know they had so much fan access at the stadium. So they're really doing it well in both both aspects. That's that's fantastic. Uh, you know, how excited is Houston for getting the championship uh, game, Kirsten? Uh, I would say that's really big for them. I know that all of our media members are really excited about that. Obviously, in my in my first season of covering the XFL since I was not around and it was around in 2001, I was like two years old. Um, it's, it's really interesting. It's really cool to see, especially because I also cover the Tennessee Titans and the LSU Tigers. And so if, if the Roughnecks were to go to the championship in Houston, which right now they are favored to do so, that's literally three championship games that I've covered in a row, in a row which is cool for me. And also, of course, cool for the city of Houston. And I think would really do quite a bit for this team in an up and coming league to make it to the championship in their hometown the first season. And, and that's why we need the Renegades to come through and, and destroy that little plan of yours. And so they, and so they come to Houston, right, Anthony? And so they come to Houston. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like it's only a four, a three, four hour drive for us from Dallas. So that Houston championship just sets up perfectly for us to drive down there and uh, take the title. <laughs> right. That's that'll be, that'll be that actually would be uh, pretty funny. So uh, let's get into the a bit of the football teams here. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through. I would like to, for you all to have a little discussion between yourselves and kind of discuss. Who rates best at each position? As Ooh, far as we get to talk about Landry Jones, <laughs> <laughs> I don't care for Landry Jones. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, Anthony, uh, Chrissy is kind of a quarterback specialist here, so uh, so she's ready to talk about Mr. Jones. So uh, yeah, so who gets the who gets who gets the advantage at quarterback? Renegades or Roughnecks? I would absolutely say the Houston Roughnecks have the advantage of quarterback. Uh, PJ Walker is far and away the best quarterback in this league. And I think that the last home game between the Battle Hawks and the Roughnecks, that was kind of the competition between the two most established quarterbacks in the league, as established as you can be by week two. Um, Jordan Tamu, I think that he did a good job. His decision-making was a little questionable, but considering that he comes in as basically the number two quarterback in the league in that contest, and you see just how far the gap is by how outperformed just he was in general by PJ Walker, yeah. um, PJ Walker, he presents a dual threat and his ability to evade pressure and his ability 
to get outside the pocket and make plays is unparalleled in the XFL. And I think that if any quarterback is going to, to come out of this league and go back into the NFL, it's definitely PJ. He's a cat in the pocket. He I've, he moves so quick. Anthony, do you uh, is it right that the Roughnecks have the advantage? I mean, have you guys seen Landry Jones run when he scrambles out of the pocket? <laughs> he looks fantastic. Did no, you see Landry I, Jones throw uh, one touchdown and two interceptions in his very ugly debut? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, what, Anthony. I heard, I, knees, I heard his knees uh, crack, and I'll say that's that's a that's pretty cool that he can make his knees sound like that. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I I want to defend Landry Jones so bad, but but you can't. There, you, you can't. No, I mean PJ Walker is by far and clear the best quarterback in this league. The only thing I would give Landry Jones the advantage of is I think he's a little more accurate than PJ Walker. But but besides that, I I just think what PJ brings to the table with his mobility and just you know mm-hmm. the way he can improvise and make plays. I mean it is like watching. He is the Patrick Mahomes of this league. I mean the things that he can do is just spectacular to watch week after week. He's making play after play after play. He's averaging three, four touchdowns a game. I mean, I love Landry. I think he's a little rusty right now, so I think that's why mm-hmm. he's kind of struggling. He needs to get back into it. He hasn't right. really played you know, professional football in two, three years, so he needs time to develop. But I, I think the accuracy is there. His decision-making you know, is a little inconsistent, but for the most part, he's mm-hmm. completing over 70% of his passes. So he's yeah. right there. I just think he needs a week or two more. This could be the weekend where he really gets back into it. But obviously, P.J. Walker is the best quarterback in this league and most likely going to make the NFL after this. Yeah, have? and that that's one thing I will give Landry Jones kind of the benefit of the doubt because he did start off the season injured. And I will say that looking just looking through his performances since he has been back, there's been kind of a gradual sense of upward momentum. So I do agree that he could eventually get back to himself. But I Landry Jones didn't do much for me in the NFL, and I don't think that he belongs in the NFL. And the fact that he is the face of a league was kind of comical to me whenever this first opened. Yeah, I think the difference between Landry Jones and P.J. Walker also is that P.J. can bomb it deep and he has good accuracy with his deep ball. I haven't really seen that from Landry yet. It's been kind of inconsistent. And the air raid offense really depends on the quarterback being able to bomb it deep. So I would like to see that more out of Landry Jones because he tends to dump the pass off to Mm -hmm. either uh, Lance Dunbar or Cameron Artis Payne. So if he can get that deep ball game going for him, then I think he's going to excel real easily in in the XFL. Yeah. Yeah. So I think our overall general impression between quarterbacks is PJ Walker is kind of the new flashy up and comer that didn't necessarily get a chance in the NFL. And I kind of view Landry Jones as the old washed up guy that's slowly trying to make his way back, but I think will eventually fall flat. Yeah. You know, as I said, as I mentioned before about week two was just kind of an unfortunate scheduling because they couldn't predict it because you kind of got excited about Josh Johnson versus Landry, uh, Landry Jones in that game. But then you realize that they're both were coming off injuries and they're both were a bit rusty. Luckily, the second half was much more entertaining. But uh, so, yeah, so I definitely think Landry Jones was, you know, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming around anyway. But uh, mm-hmm. running backs, Mr. Butler versus the combination of Dunbar and Ortiz Payne. So uh, let's start with Anthony this time. Yeah, I, I would give the advantage to the Renegades. I mean, I really like what James Butler's done. He's been probably one of the biggest surprises this year just because everyone thought, you know, Andre Williams was going to go in there and be the starter just because of being one of the runner-ups of the Heisman Trophy when he was at Boston College. But James Butler came in there, and he just looks a, more of a natural fit in that Roughnecks offense, being able to catch the ball out of the backfield and get those outside runs. I, I, I'm impressed with what James Butler has done. But I, I just think between Cameron Artis Payne and Lance Dunbar, there's not many combos out there in the XFL that can compete with them. I mean, Lance Dunbar is such a weapon in the passing game for Landry Jones. He's really bailed out Landry Jones on a lot of situations by being able to make plays uh, through the air. Um, but Cameron, you know, had, had a sh- really rough week one against the Battle Hawks. But in the last two weeks, he's really come on strong, especially in the second half. And I think he runs the ball really well so they can get him more carries then I, I think the Renegades should should think about maybe changing their offense a bit more to running the ball because I think that's where their bigger strength is than the passing game. But I love the way Cameron Artis Payne runs the ball, and I love the way Lance Dunbar catches it. So I would give the advantage to the Renegades in the backfield. 
Can I just quickly ask you, why was it that RT – because you said he struggled in week one, but he only had two carries. Why was it that he only had two carries, you think? I, I think the Renegades wanted to – they want to be a passing team. That's just what they want to be, and I think they just wanted to let Phil Nelson throw short – three, five-yard passes to either the running back or the receiver. So it just felt like they were forcing a lot of passes in there. And I don't think they really knew what they had in the backfield until uh, it really exploded in week two against L.A. And then they realized, oh, wow, Cameron Artis Payne is actually really good, and Lance Dunbar should get the ball more too. So I, I think that's kind of where the disparity was, where they want to pass the ball, but they have such good running backs that they just got to they got to hand it off more more often, because I think that's where the success the success is going to be for the team. That's a pretty strong argument. Uh, Chrissy, what do you say? I honestly uh, second everything that Anthony had to say, and I think uh, one interesting point to bring up that he kind of touched on is considering that this is a new league, considering that there was no film to watch in week one, every team is still kind of establishing their identity. They've never played their next opponent and, until they face them, really. They don't really know what they have or what they're what they're up against, and they're still trying to figure out what their own strengths are. And as far as Dallas goes, I, I think that they were trying to be a passing team originally, and I also think that they're continuing to steadily establish their run game and they're starting to find success with that. And one thing as, as dominant as the roughnecks have been, the fact that they are the final undefeated team in the XFL, they have a suspect. Defense. And <laughs> let's, I let's, let's, let's emphasize that. Chrissy. Let's emphasize undefeated team. Yes. <laughs> but I, I talk with June Jones after every home game, the head coach of the, of the roughnecks. I almost said renegade. See, I'm about to mess up. <laughs> um, and that's one thing that he said after the Battle Hawks game is, you know, there's a lot of things that went wrong. There's a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of things that we should have done differently because you'll notice how the Battle Hawks shouldn't have been able to get back in that game, but they were able to. And the Roughnecks have allowed the six most points allowed per game so far. And so I think that as the Renegades are continuing to establish the run game, as they're continuing to figure out who they are on offense, they can really, really exploit that uh, in this coming weekend. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's uh, so moving on to wide receiver. Wide receiver is going to be a little interesting because uh, let me just say real quick that uh, on my podcast, I had a preview of this, these two uh, teams mm -hmm. and uh, and I liked the receivers that I thought the receivers fit the renegade system. So I thought, you know, they made a lot of sense. And then when I looked at the, uh, the Houston receivers, I, I undervalued valued them big time because I didn't I, I, I use a lot of NFL scouting information. And so I, my information told me that these receivers were not that highly thought of. But man, mm -hmm. they've run out. But who is actually better? Uh, Chrissy. Um, I would say that the chemistry between PJ Walker and Cam, and Cam Phillips is going to be very, very hard to disrupt. And then on top of that, just how good PJ Walker is as a passer, just how good he is as a quarterback. He it, he himself is an asset to his receivers. He can use himself to make his receivers better. And this offense that the Roughnecks have been running has been unstoppable thus far. So that's going to be really, really big for the Renegades to come up with an answer. But the Renegades, as we talked about earlier, do have the better defense and they are steadily getting better as a whole. So I think so far with the opponents that Houston's faced if anyone's going to start to come up with a way to answer that it's probably going to be Dallas Anthony yeah I, I would give the advantage to the Roughnecks just because I think Cam Phillips is the best receiver in the league right now and mm -hmm. I think Dallas doesn't utilize the receivers as much as other teams do I think Dallas is very reliant on their tight end Donald Pollum and uh, their running backs to really help in the passing game so really, you know, outside of Flynn Nagel, uh, there really hasn't been a receiver for the Renegades that has really stood out to me this year. There's some really good ones. Like I was a big believer in Jazz Ferguson, you know, coming yeah. into the season just because of his big play ability. But he hasn't way. really he hasn't really played as much. So, it, you know, the receivers for Renegades have been kind of slow to get off the bat. Um, Jeff Bedette's been pretty good this year, but besides that, it's really been Donald Parham and Lance Dunbar that have been a big part of the passing game. So I think w when you look at Houston, I mean, they got 
Cam Phillips, who's obviously been the best receiver in the league. Uh, Nick Hawley, who's, you know, a dynamic, you know, running back and receiver. So he could kind of do it both ways. Um, Sam Mobley has been pretty good for them. And Sammy Coates, you know, comes in with a lot of NFL experience. So it's, it's really hard to beat the receiving core that Houston has right now. So I give him the advantage there. Yes, but you know what? You mentioned a few things there. Jazz Ferguson is an LSU transfer to Northwestern State, by the way. So I'm pretty familiar with Jazz Ferguson. But uh, so I thought I also thought he would uh, produce more than he has so far. But I also thought Sammy Coates out of Auburn University would have been really the star for Houston. But he is not. He either will come one day and make this receiving core even stronger, or it, it is as it is. They they find Cam Phillips, Phillips and. Uh, and Walker have a good rapport with him, with, with each mm-hmm. other, so that's working out well enough. So they actually don't need Sammy Coates, and that I think that speaks for it. That says it right there that they don't even need Sammy Coates to perform, and they're still performing. So that's yeah. I smart. mean, there was there was a lot of talk about Sammy Coates and how he was, I guess, in camp before the season started. And I think a lot of us were surprised to see him make as little of an impact as he did. But that is that really is just the way that it's gone so far in Cam Phillips as has been mentioned already, and this is definitely the best receiver in the league and is probably going to be the standout player of this game. Right. Oh, this game, we're already going there. All right. Uh, <laughs> but also, Anthony mentioned Donald Parham. Uh, he, uh, he, by the way, is a tight end. So, Chrissy, tight ends on Houston, how are they? <laughs> Um, we don't have a, we actually do not have an official tight end on our roster. So, so there you go. Very, the difference of the game is the tight very end. interesting. <laughs> Finally, the Renegades win in something. There we go. Yeah, right. All the, the question is how much do they actually need a tight end? I, I would say that uh, that passing game, that passing game is doing just fine without one. Right. No, I mean, best offense in the league. Uh, yeah. I mean, they don't need a tight end. They're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting. I actually like the tight end position is, but anyway, Offensive line, how is that? Uh, who do we have? I think Christy started last time. So, Anthony? Um, I mean, I, I would say it's per, it, it depends. So, pass blocking, you probably give it to Houston, even though, you know, when it comes down to pass blocking, P.J. Walker is able to just, you know, make plays with his feet. So, I don't know if it really matters or not, just because he's so athletic. Um, I think they probably have the advantage in pass blocking over Dallas. I think with Landry Jones, he's not mobile at all. So I think he takes a lot more hits when, than he, um, needs to. I know that first half of the Seattle game, he took a lot of hits. There was a lot of pressure on him. So that offensive line pass blocking wise probably isn't the best, but in terms of run blocking, I would give the advantage to the renegades. Cause I think they do such a good job of opening up those lanes in the middle and they do a great job of pulling those guards when it comes down to running to the outside. So I really like what the renegades do in terms of run blocking. I think Houston, we saw a major breakthrough with their run blocking this past weekend against Tampa. I think James Butler is able to get some nice runs in there. I think he was averaging 10 yards a carry in that game off of seven carries. So that's kind of where, uh, you know, I think it's improving for the Roughnecks in terms of run blocking. But uh, for, for the Renegades, I give them the advantage, at least in run blocking. Chrissy. Yeah, I'd say that the O-line has been solid enough in Houston from what I've seen. But as as it was mentioned, I do think that P.J. Walker is one of those quarterbacks that's athletic, athletic enough and can make plays with his legs enough to the point that he almost invites the opportunity to get outside the pocket and to do something. I mean, he'll run all the way to his right, just right by the sideline and he'll fit it into a tight window. So I, I would say that how good your offensive line is, is probably going to come down to Dallas more because they need it more. Uh, But I, I would say that Houston's done. Okay. And just speaking as far as offensive line goes. Yep. Uh, So Houston, they have, accomplished 10 sacks and Dallas has had five on this season so far, but the defensive line is not always about sacks, is it? So who has the advantage at defensive line, Chrissy? You know, I, I would say that overall that the renegades probably have the better defense as far as that goes. Um, I, I think that there are still some things that need to be fixed within Houston's defense as a whole. I'd say that their secondary is probably their strongest aspect there. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I would say in terms of defensive line, um, I'd probably give the advantage to Houston. I just think uh, with Coney Ely and Gabe Wright, I think they've done a, a really good job on that defensive line. I think the Renegades are more built on what they do with their linebacking core because they need their outside linebackers to really act as defensive ends and ask as a you know as pass. Uh, you know, in pass coverage as well. So I think the, that defense is really built on how the linebackers do. So defensive line, you know, Frank Alexander has had a, a nice season so far. He hasn't um, really been the impact player that I thought he would be. But um, overall, it's a solid defensive line. But I would give the Roughnecks just the advantage there. The linebackers, so, so you mentioned linebackers. So just go ahead, go ahead and continue with the linebackers, uh, Anthony. Yeah, so um, I know there's been some guys there, you know, like Greer Martini's probably been the the standout. Um, As- Asante Brown has really done a good job coming off the bench and um, done a great job against the run and in pass coverage. You know, Greer Martini, his uh, his you know his specialty is pass coverage, so he's really done a great job of that. I think overall the linebacking core is really solid. For the Renegades, and you know, just being a three-four defense, they their make or break is what happens with the linebacking core. So I really like what they have done. I think they're they do they see they need some development with those guys, but overall, they're that's not, that's a fast group that can get to the quarterback and add some pressure. So maybe they won't get as many sacks as those teams will, but they can definitely add pressure to the quarterback. Chrissy, have you had any anything particular to? Uh to add about the linebackers for either Roughnecks or Renegades? Um, as far as linebackers go, I'd say that Kalen Burnett, a uh, former Tennessee Titan, played for five games there. Uh, he had a good week one, but one thing that June Jones has talked about is pass rush. And that came into play a lot whenever they were playing against Jordan Tamu with the Battle Hawks, and he was overall pretty satisfied with how how they did that and how they got to the quarterback and they were able to force those two interceptions. But I think there is still some work that needs to be done there. Yeah, and I think that that's my concern with the linebackers for the Renegades. When they faced Jordan Tiamu in week one, they really had a hard time containing him. In that second half, he was able to break off some nice runs and was able to run out of that pocket and to make some pass plays. So that's going to be my my real big concern. Can they contain P.J. Walker? Because they're going to have to have a linebacker or two drop back and be a QB spy just to follow him around the whole game, which could take away from their coverage or any um, you know pressure they want to bring on the quarterback. So that would be my concern is if the linebacking core cannot contain PJ Walker, it could be a long day for the Renegades defense. Yeah, I de- I would definitely agree with that because I would put Walker over Tamu as as good as Tamu has been in being mobile. I would say that Walker has definitely definitely trumped him in that area. So uh, Chrissy, you mentioned the secondary being the strength. You want to elaborate on that? Give us a little more about the second. And go ahead and, and, and talk about the uh, safeties and cornerbacks together. Um, I would just say overall, just I'm what I'm referencing there is the takeaways, just the, the key takeaways. I haven't I don't have a total on the season handy right now as far as how many takeaways they have, but I can say from being there that whenever the interceptions have happened, they have happened in crucial moments. And I think that that showed a lot in the in the game against the Battle Hawks whenever Jordan did throw those two interceptions, whenever it came close after after the first half was over, and then they had to get – one second. I believe there were plus five okay. on, there were plus five on turnovers as a team, and they yeah. have five interceptions on the year. Yeah, uh, no, because – Renegades, by the way, are negative three on the turnover ratio. Yeah, um, Houston, yeah, Houston had a very solid lead over the Battle Hawks in the first half, and then they came back in the second half and – St. Louis was able to draw very close. And then it was in those two interceptions that Houston was able to really gain the momentum back and then win that game because that was a very losable game for them. And I think that the secondary was a big part of coming up and really turning the tide. Anthony? Yeah, I would say in terms of the Renegades secondary, I mean, this is is a defense that's not going to create turnovers very often. They're not really known for that. But... You know, I look at guys like Josh Hawkins, who's been, you know, he's a veteran corner that played in the NFL with the Packers. He's done well this year. He got an interception last week. So he's a good shutdown corner when you need him to go one on one with a receiver. I feel very confident that he would be able to um, 
come in there and shut down the receiver. Uh, Deron Smith is one of the top five safeties in this league and probably one of the top five defensive players in this league. I love what his uh, ball hawking ability and being able to break up passes and um, big tackles. So I really like what he's done. I think overall the secondary has been it's been okay. It hasn't been great. It's not their strength to the defense, but I think it's definitely improving as the week's gone on. I thought they had a really good game against Seattle. They kind of struggled in the first half, but that secondary really clamped down and uh, made life miserable for Brandon Silvers in the second half. Yeah. Moving on to special teams uh, without saying too much, because we'll get to that part much a little bit uh, further on. But special teams, is this just a quick yes or no? Is this game going to be a field goal? Is is, there, is this going to be a, a difference of a field goal or what, Chrissy? You know, I don't – it's funny because in this league, field goals almost don't matter. We haven't seen a lot of them, and we haven't seen a lot of them from the Roughnecks. Now, Sergio Castillo, he's been solid whenever they've needed him, but they haven't used him very much. So, I mean – if we're, if we're talking about field goals, I would say yes, that the Roughnecks will do well and that their kicker is proven. But this this is a league that just hasn't come down to field goals very much and certainly not for Houston. Yeah, for Dallas, it's a complete opposite. I mean, Austin McGinnis has been called on multiple times. So he leads the league in field goals made and field goals attempted. So it, it could absolutely come down to field goals, at least for the Renegades. They've had some trouble trying to finish drives. So I don't know if that's going to end up hurting them just because the Roughnecks are just one of those teams where they can score a touchdown on one play very easily. They, they got big playability. But the Renegades really rely on their special teams probably more than anyone else. I mean, their their punters top, you know, one of the top three in the league in terms of you know punt average. You got Austin McGinnis, who's probably the top in the league as a kicker. So Dallas really relies on their special teams, and they may rely on them very heavily if they want to beat Houston. Yeah, I think that Houston will be the exact opposite hmm. for sure. So let's get to let's get to a little bit, bit more of the game here on the uh, and let's break it down to the quarters first quarter second quarter third quarter fourth quarter in the first quarter it's usually the time in the first quarter where teams you know they have to fill each other out they have a, their game plan and they they want to see how their game plan will work based on what the defense the offense of the other team is doing so in this in this first quarter what expectations or what surprises can we expect from Hal Mummy or June Jones is there a certain player as we talked about Sammy Coates perhaps. Is there a certain player that we haven't really seen uh, utilized yet that you might see a little more of to to take advantage of the other uh, side? Or, or what, is there any surprises or anything that you might that we might see differently in these games? Let's start with Anthony. Um, I think in the first quarter, I just know from Dallas Renegades, they're not a first half team. I mean, they usually get off to very slow starts. It usually takes them um, some time to really develop their stride. They usually hit their stride around the third or fourth quarter. So to me, that could end up being a very dangerous thing just because Houston is usually the type of team that gets off the fast starts just because of how um, big, you know, how many big play abilities they have with their offense. So Dallas's defense is really going to have to clamp down in that first quarter, especially in the secondary. So I look at guys like Josh Hawkins and Deron Smith, who are going to have to make plays and are going to have to really step up against the, you know, Houston's top receivers in guys like, you know, Cam Phillips and Sammy Coates and even guys like James Butler, who can make an impact in the running game or the passing game. So, so if Dallas doesn't win that first quarter or win that second quarter, they're probably going to lose this game because Houston is probably going to get off to a fast start. So that defense is really going to have to step up and keep the offense in the game. And it's pretty solid because, you know, I think Renegades have been a bit of a slow start team, haven't they? Yeah. And, and Houston has definitely gotten to the board sometimes as early as the first, like two, three minutes. And I think that that continues and that's been kind of their strength. And I almost, in a way, I almost want to compare it to LSU because I did cover LSU's national championship season, just how quickly and how dominantly they're able to pass the ball down the field. And I feel like they've done so well with their passing attack to where the the run, the run game is kind of just something else that they, that they utilize. And I, I feel like they can move the ball down the field very well, very quickly, very efficiently. And they have started these games really fast. And I think that they'll continue to do that. And I think that what this is going to come down to is the Renegades are probably going to start. They're going to start slower. And I think that Houston leads for the majority of this game. But the question is, with the defenses, these are two very different defenses. And the Renegades definitely have the upper hand. 
So it's going to come down to whether or not they can shut down or just at least limit PJ Walker and then get their offense going enough to where they can kind of slide by. But I don't, I don't think that if Dallas wins, I do not think they win it by a landslide. You know, to be honest with you, uh, both it's kind of interesting that both of these teams have two of the same uh, opponents, actually. They both play Los Angeles, and they both play at St. Louis. So there's actually, even though we're this early in the year, there's actually a lot on the tape for both of them, and they can see uh, they can see some things. So I'm not too sure how many surprises we will get, but we'll see if both Mummy and uh, June Jones really open up some trick plays or anything like that. We'll see about that. But uh, something, you know, in their back pocket. But so with that in mind about how things are kind of shown already, we see that Jones really finds Parham, especially at the big moments. He really gets his six eight tight end. He hits him in stride and he gets him, uh, you know, he, he, he could easily find him. He's doing a really good job of finding his big tight end. And he's really given Donald Parham a really, uh, I think, I think, Parham is getting a lot from working with Landry Jones as in, you know, as opposed to maybe another quarterback. Because I think Landry Jones might be experienced enough to understand how to throw to certain receivers just from his experience of playing. And I'm sure he, I think he's just, he, he, he's learned, he's quickly picked up how to utilize Parham. And I think that's a, that's a big asset for the Renegades. So how does the Roughnecks answer that, uh, Chrissy? How, how do they defend this little, this little connection they have? Um, as, I mean, as June Jones has put it before, I think that it comes down to the pass rush. I think it comes down to Landry Jones being strictly a pocket passer and really getting him under duress in the pocket. Uh, because PJ Walker is going to be able to do a lot more under duress in the pocket to the point that he's almost more dangerous that way than Landry Jones is. So I think that if this defense can step up, and I think that if they can make sure that Landry Jones doesn't have all day to throw. I think that that's really what it comes down to. Right. I 100%, 100% uh, agree. But especially on pass rush, the interior with Gabe Wright and, and Lyons, I think these two guys are really going to be a big asset for the defense for Houston to really put pressure and to uh, disrupt uh, Landry's vision. And, you know, just, just the interior pressure is going to really help the Roughnecks defense. On the other side, we have, and we talked a little bit about PJ Walker in the pocket and how he moves. But uh, so, how does how does Dallas answer PJ in the offense? Yeah, I, I think it really comes down to the linebacking core. I mean, they're going to have to drop one or two of their linebackers back to just be strictly QB spies on PJ Walker the whole game. I mean, they got to make him uh, beat them by. PJ Walker staying in the pocket and making those throws, which could be dangerous as well. So it really first starts with the linebacking core, just being able to not only provide pressure on PJ Walker, but containing him inside that pocket. And it's also going to be on the secondary. I mean, they're just going to have to, this is a really good Houston receiving core. That's probably the best in the league. And the, the, the secondary is just going to have to step up and, um, you know, make some plays and coverage. It's really going to be about creating turnovers. Dallas has got to win the turnover battle. And that's something they have not done very often this year. So if they can win that turnover battle and be able to contain Walker to um, minimal passing yards and keep him in that pocket, then I think Dallas has a really good chance of winning it. Right. You know, it's always interesting to see how teams respond throughout the year. If they can break their trends, like we talked about Dallas being a slow start, and Dallas not having being a minus three in turnover, those two things would really, you know, this would be a big thing in this game. And we'll see if they could overcome those two uh, those, those two frailties that they have as a team. Moving on to the third quarter. So when, in the third quarter, you come out the halftime, and things are already going along. So, so if you have the lead, you either have to maintain the lead or you have to fight back. And this is a little bit about that the Renegade starting off slow. But, uh, you know, with with... Chrissy, with the with June Jones's style of play, he throws a lot, and he mm-hmm. uh, even if you know even if he has a big lead, he might still throw. Which in XFL with the time rules is a bit different because it doesn't really matter if you throw or if you run before the the, the two minute warning, but uh, but it still provides the defense a chance for those interceptions and those turnovers, as uh, as Anthony was mentioning. So so is June Jones? Is that going to be is that going to be the opening for the Renegades? Maybe they start off slow, but then they get some turnovers because June Jones keeps throwing the ball. Or Any comments? 
Yeah, but I I don't think that Dallas has done well in that area, and I think that that trend continues. So I think that June Jones likes throwing the ball. I think that he's going to continue throwing the ball. It would be interesting to see him run it a little bit more, and depending on where the score is at that point, it might be a little bit safer, but I don't think that we see a significant change this week. Yeah, I mean, if if it, in my opinion, if it's not broken, don't fix it, and that's something with Houston with the passing game. I mean, that's just something they're good at, and I think that's that the type of offense they have with the run and shoot. They got to be full throttle from the first quarter to the fourth quarter on how they pass the ball. I mean, even in the fourth quarter of last week's game when they had the lead, you still saw Houston throwing the football because that's just what they're good at. So. Right. It's it's really imperative that Dallas does not get off to a bad start again, because if they're behind in the third quarter, then that's going to force Landry Jones to throw the ball. And that's when you start seeing how mummy being a little more panicked and how the pack, you know, what the play calling is going to be, because Dallas is more prone to running the ball better in the second half when they get into a rhythm. So if they can stay within, you know, six to nine points in that contest then Dallas can run the ball in the second half, control the time of possession, keep the ball out of P.J. Walker's hands, and that's how they're going to propel their way to winning the game. Are we actually being fair with Dallas, though? Because they played Seattle, they played St. Louis, and Los Angeles. And Los Angeles actually, you know, that game against Los Angeles would have been a little bit different if uh, if Elijah Hood didn't fumble those two times, really. Because they were, they were actually making a little bit of... Uh, progress down the field and especially the one close to the to the goal line so but these are teams actually when you look at it seattle st louis and los angeles that that you know they're more balanced than throwing a lot you know they haven't th- faced a, a, a team that's thrown all that's, that haven't given them that hasn't provided a whole whole lot of opportunity for interceptions so that might be something to at least to at least put you know mark down a little bit maybe Maybe it's more the the style of offense that has not allowed Dallas to get these turnovers. Um, fourth quarter. All right, any comments, Chrissy? Sounds like you. <laughs> I I'd say in the fourth quarter, I would think that at that point, the Houston would have built up a pretty solid lead. As as I've said earlier, I think that Houston starts this game fast. I think that Dallas starts slow, and I think that. I really think that Dallas just has their hands full too much in this because they're already beat at the quarterback position. There's a chemistry between Phillips and Walker. There's the secondary. There's a comparison and who wins the turnover turnover battle. I mean, I think that if history repeats itself, that's four things just off the top of my head that I've named that those are four severe problems that Dallas has where areas in which they're behind. And so I, I think I think that Houston wins this one, not necessarily by a large margin, but I, I think it's it's going to be a comfortable win. I don't think it's going to come down to the last seconds being a nail biter like we saw with St. Louis. I'm, I'm going to hate to disappoint Boomer Nation. Uh, Anthony, do, do you have anything to the fourth quarter? Uh, uh, this is just to go at it. You know, the fourth quarter, the game is on the line. Now it's all the all the fill out is gone. Now this is time to get rough and dirty. So, Anthony, what do you have to say? Yeah, I would say in the fourth quarter, the advantage goes to Dallas. I mean, just watching this, how this team played in the last you know, three games. I mean, the fourth quarter is usually where Dallas hits their shot in the passing game and the running game. So it, I, I feel like if Dallas can stay within 10 points of Houston going into the fourth quarter, I feel pretty good about their chances because this is where their offense gets to a rhythm. They start getting more. They start improving in their running game and they start building that up. Landry Jones is now more is now comfortable enough where he knows what he's seeing in the defense so he can make better reads, he can make better throws, and they can start making um, bigger plays. So if Dallas is within 10 points in, going into the fourth quarter, I feel like they have a very good chance of winning this game. Now, are they going to beat Houston? My opinion is I I don't think they're going to beat Houston just because <laughs> I, 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 I think – I Anthony. think PJ, yeah. Anthony, tell yes. tell Chrissy where you had Houston at the beginning of the season. I had them pretty low. I did not <laughs> think PJ Walker, I'll, I'll just say that. I had them pretty low. I did not know PJ Walker was going to be this good. Wasn't but, uh, it seventh, right? Or was it sixth or seventh? I think it was seventh. Hey, I never claimed to be an expert. We all mess up on stuff, and I definitely screwed up on Houston. So I will admit when I make a mistake, that team is really good. <laughs> Where was it that you? Where was it that you were? Uh, where? Not, of course, you weren't wrong, Anthony. But where were you? Maybe you know a little bit off. 
I, I, you know, I just didn't know. I, I knew PJ Walker was a good passer. I just didn't know how, you know, how much of a dynamic, you know, weapon he was going to be. You know, so I mean, just the way that he has played has has really surprised me that he's really developed in this league as mm-hmm. the premier passer. And you know, I didn't know how good their running game was going to be because I didn't know how much confidence I had in Andre Williams. But it ended up being James Butler and the being the, the the guy there has really stood out. The receiving core has been better. You know, I think the defense does need some improvements for the Roughnecks, but offensively, they've blown me away with how good they've been. Right. Well, you, uh, a few things there. Andre Williams actually was a he's a power back. So I was, that's one thing I mentioned in my uh, preview, my season preview was that I wasn't sure how uh, June Jones was going to utilize Andre Williams as the power back. Because I didn't see him as an option in the passing game so much. And I was like, it'll be interesting to see him because he was actually drafted pretty highly, as I recall. But he is not really. This was, yeah. So that's a little bit of a funny thing that he, that you draft him so high, but he is not being utilized. But in the fairness to you as well, with from the outside, there was a lot of conversation if Connor Cook was going to be the starting quarterback. So this dynamic quarterback was never really, not really in the conversation so much to start with. So, uh, so I think that's easy to. Uh, there was no, there's no clear quarterback. I think when you made that your power rankings. So because there was no, and there was no clear quarterback. So how would you know? And I'm, I'm right with you. PG Walker, I thought he was going to be, you know. A multiple uh, uh, dual quarterback type, but I did not know he was this dynamic. I didn't. His ability to move through the pocket, his little quick mo- motions—they're very, very fascinating. They're very good. I enjoy it. Uh, so, who's the who's the coach? Who, who, what team has the coaching advantage, Chrissy? I would say that June Jones has done a pretty good job overall. I think that he needs to correct some things within his defense, but I think offensively speaking, that there's there's not much there to fix. Yeah, I, I I would give the slight advantage to Bob Stoops and his coaching staff. You know, I I get a little frustrated at times with the play calling of Hal Mummy, but I still think that the offense that they have developed there is really good. They just put a really good overall group of, of players on that on the field. Uh, defensively, I really like what Chris Woods has done. I know he's a player favorite. The players love playing for him. And I think what's he's what he's developed there, that defense has been pretty good. You know, and you no, know, especially again, you know, the Battle Hawks, you know, despite, you know, losing that game, they had still only allowed 15 points and they kept that offense in the game the whole time. So we really probably should have won that game if Landry Jones would have played. And then, you know, looking at the the Seattle Dragons game, you know, that defense did a great job in the second half, completely shutting down um, the Dragons to really only being able to get first downs on two of the drives for the rest of the game. So what Chris Woods is building there, that, that's a pretty good defense. Yeah, I like it. Who, who's who's really the undefeated team if you don't have the quarterback, right? So it's really two undefeated teams. Nice one there, Anthony. But, uh, you know, Chris Woods has an interesting background because he came from a lot of small colleges, junior colleges. He worked with at Oklahoma for a year or two as just a defensive analyst or assistant. Then he went to Sam Houston State as defensive coordinator. So just looking at his resume, it wasn't, it was, wasn't that, you know, overly impressive so to, to to for him to have success at this level good for him uh so fan bases so we're going to be going to uh global life park or what is it called field in dallas or, or is the dallas uh fan base going to make the difference in this game anthony um i th- i think it could make a, a significant difference just because that you know global life park is a little bit of a smaller field and they only have a certain amount of seats that are being sold. So it sounds louder just because it feels closer to the field. So yeah. um, they were they were pretty loud and rowdy that first game against the St. Louis Battlehawks. So I think that could definitely be end up being an advantage if Houston finds it. You know, if P.J. Walker finds it to be too loud to make calls, he may have to do some, you know, silent signals or something like that. But, yeah, I, I think the crowd could have an impact in the game. I, I love to – before the season started, it was fascinating to watch those uh, those those transformations from the baseball to the football, and and I th- I love even though St. Louis has the, the the dome and they're the only NFL team or professional team without having an NFL team now, I love how there's an actual XFL stadium in the league. So uh, so that's really nice. Um, so but like you said, it's only about what two or three hours away. So is Houston going to travel to Dallas for this game, Chrissy? 
You know, I can't answer that question because they haven't had a road game except for Tampa Bay. And I've driven to Tampa Bay before, and it is a very, very long way away from Houston. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I think they have passionate fans. They have dedicated fans that really show up and show out at the home games. It's just a matter of who makes the trip to Dallas. Yep, that's going to be really interesting to see this this uh, rivalry build up and play out. And it starts on this weekend, and it's going to be exciting. And it's going to be good football. These are two of the top teams. They're just finding themselves, well, especially Renegades, are finding themselves with Landry Jones getting more and more into the rhythm of things. Roughnecks have been firing off, and they're still continuing firing off. They had a good challenge in Tampa, and Tampa Bay actually showed out. And I don't think it was I don't think it was Roughnecks playing bad. I think Tampa Bay played good. And so it's that was, also uh, taking Aaron Murray out as your quarterback. That'll do that for you. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. But, you know, this is uh, this has been I've heard it called the Texas FL game. And uh, Bob Stoops shared a, a tweet that it was well, called te- the mm-hmm. Texas Texas FL. <laughs> Texas FL. Yeah. Uh, so any final remarks as we go and get ready for the weekend? Chrissy, what is do, you don't have necessarily have to make a score prediction. We, we kind of talked about a little bit of what you thought about the game. Yeah. But just have your final thoughts. Um, like I like I said earlier, I think that the Renegades are outmatched in several categories. I think that the only true advantage that they have is having a significantly better defense than Houston. But I think that Houston's power out, powerhouse offense is just too much to match for them. And I think that the Roughnecks win by 10 points on the road. Anthony? I think this may be the best game of the year so far. I'm really interested to see how the Renegades you know, face off against the Roughnecks because this will be, no doubt, their biggest challenge of the year. So I, I think it really comes down to how Landry Jones plays. Um, we've seen him get off the slow starts in two straight weeks. I'm hoping that the rustiness is finally you know, lifted off of him and he can finally you know, get into uh, the quarterback that we saw him play when he was at Oklahoma. So I think it really comes down to how Landry Jones plays and how he protects the football. If Dallas wins the turnover battle and wins the time of possession and keeps P.J. Walker off the field, then I think they're going to win the game. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give a f- official prediction. I think the Roughnecks are going to win. I think it's going to be very close. I can see it being a six-point game. Six points. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to remember that when I place my bets. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think, it's, I think y'all both have a pretty good uh, – Feel of this game as well. I, I agree with a lot of you. With, I agree with a lot of what both of you say, and uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be really exciting. It's gonna be. I think it's gonna be. I think week four. <laughs> <you laughing? laughs> week four is gonna be really exciting in general for the XFL. So, but let me ask you to to finish this off. Is this the semifinal? Because if you look at this, if you look at the schedule, Los Angeles has already lost to these two teams, and they are of course in the same division. So is uh. Is Dallas, is this really just a, 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 an exhibition game for the semifinal? I'd, I'd say there's a strong possibility of that. I could definitely see it happening. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm a huge believer in what Seattle's doing. And then L.A., I need a, a week or two more to kind of see what type of team they are with Josh Johnson. But um, besides that, I think Houston and Dallas not only are the you know top two teams in the West, but they may be two of the top three teams in the league. Right. I think the West, I think those three teams, I think Los Angeles might have just clicked and might have, might show out for the rest of the year. But might yeah, be. I think I think it's worth noting that Dallas is probably as far as upward momentum goes, moving up faster than those other teams in the division. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's that's a that's a nice little word from Chrissy about the Dallas team to finish off. So the, the Renegade fans appreciate that one, Chrissy. <laughs> Yeah, I've kind of been dogging the whole team this whole time, but it's fine. <laughs> but you're more than welcome to. Anthony, it's been uh, nice. Chrissy, it's been a pleasure again. And I think y'all have provided the listeners some fascinating conversation about this big matchup this weekend. It's going to be this, the first of many, and it's going to be very exciting to see. Uh, it's only to be, look forward to and get excited about. about, about. And... Uh, I do hope y'all enjoy the games, enjoy the weekends, enjoy the XFL. This has been the episode Rivalry Ruckus with Chrissy Freud and Anthony Miller joining the uh, podcast on the SEC Junction XFL podcast. Find me on Twitter at The Swamp Dane 
Facebook page, SEC Junction, XFL. And don't forget the XFL Covercast on LandryFootball.com. Do crack back and let's talk about the XFL. It can't get any better for spring football. Check out. <laughs> <laughs>